I would like to introduce you to the first of my lectures, um, basically about orthotropics. Um, I'm going to start with the really basic aspects of growth and of malocclusion. Before we really think about um, malocclusion itself, we should perhaps consider um, what controls normal growth and indeed what might go wrong with normal growth. Um, I was um, interested in botany and biology as a student. Um, and I was very impressed with the work of John Gurdon. At the time, he was working at Oxford, although later he went on to become professor at Cambridge. Anyway, he did some quite unique work with tadpoles and frogs. He removed um, a cell from the intestine of a tadpole, and he put the cell from the fully formed tadpole into um, an egg having removed its nucleus. This is very fine work as the nucleus is minute, but anyway. Um, what was remarkable is that the uh, egg turned into a fully formed tadpole which then continued to become a frog and interestingly it was an exact replica of the frog that had been produced from the tadpole um, from which he had re originally removed the nucleus. This makes one realise that every single cell in the body, certainly of a tadpole, um, is able to replicate the entire frog. This has been subsequently carried out with mammals and you may have heard, remember Dolly the sheep um, a similar situation. It's called cloning and in effect one can replicate almost any individual by this really very detailed method. What is significant about this is that it means that um, at the time when our cells first started to form multicellular organisms um, this is all oh, about three million years ago. Um, but at that time, um, the cells first began to clump together and form multicellular organisms. And many people feel that each of the cells in the body are totally subservient. But no, I am sure they are not. I actually created a theory that I call the cell volition theory. Well, and <clears throat> basically it claims that the cells work together for the good of the host, but still maintain their own individual volition. Um, take that or not as you like it. But um, in effect, I'm saying that the cellular growth of the organism is controlled by the cells individually. Uh, as an example, I can quote the, a little marine animal called the hydra. Um, it consists of just a tube of cells. It's only a few millimetres long. It has a sticker at the bottom and tentacles at the top. If you remove one of the tentacles, you'll find that it will grow back. Now, pause and think, how does it know to do that? What's in control? It doesn't have a brain, doesn't have any system within it. Um, therefore, it has to be the individual cells around the wound say, Hi, the uh, tendril's gone, we better create another one. I mean, all right, I don't think there's any conscious thought about it, but it certainly shows that ability exists within every cell of the hydra. Equally, if with a human, if you remove a whole lobe of the liver, you'll find that it will regrow, provided the patient is fit and well, and uh, um, in the same shape and size as it was before. So we haven't entirely lost our ability to replicate various parts of our body. Um, we can now perhaps look at 
um, an area such as the mandible. I was taught during my schooling, dental school, that there were control systems which controlled the growth either via the nervous system or the lymphatic system or maybe hormones or maybe some other method we didn't understand at all. I can remember resecting the, uh, um, the cartilage of the nose in to research the possibility that the cartilage controlled the growth of the maxilla. Uh, it didn't work and I think now people realize that's not true but it shows that how really ignorant we were about the causes. Anyway, going back to the palisade of cells which envelops every mandible um, during maybe change, you know that if the mouth is left wide open, the man will actually change his shape. Well, we might say, what controls that change of shape? It has to be the individual cells. But we can't have a control system which tells several million cells to do slightly different things depending on where they're situated around the margin of the mandible. Clearly, each of these cells knows what shape it should be. All it then really needs to know is where it is. Now, um, that brings me to another interesting, well, I'm going to call it research, but let's take a butterfly, for instance. Um, you know it has these beautiful patterns of colour on its wing. Each of the individual cells that make up the colours come from the neural spine, which runs down the butterfly's back. But it does not grow in its position, it moves through the other cells, it's not motile, in some way it's able to wriggle between all the other cells in the wing of the butterfly, which must move in some way to let it through until it reaches the exact spot where it needs to display its colour and it does so along with all the other colour cells to create this beautiful pattern we see when we look at the butterfly. Now, this must make us wonder, how does it know to do that? It has to know where it is. It must carry a map of the entire animal so that it can say, well, I'm supposed to do this particular job and I must do it at that particular point or position. This is why position is so important in growth and also why over time posture is important. If you hold your jaw in one particular position it will grow over time to suit that position. That is why oral posture is so influential in controlling the growth of, well, the jaws and of hence the face. I'll talk a little further about that in my next presentation.